Okay, let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this day, for the sunshine that we enjoy, even as we look forward to a prediction of uh, some nasty weather tomorrow. We pray that we will remain safe wherever we are, that we don't have to go out into that bad weather and risk any injuries or any other consequences of that bad weather. We pray for those who have no choice and have to be out, that you would keep them safe and they're able to do the thing that they're called to do no matter what the weather might be. We know that those are the first responders, the police officers, all those who dedicate their lives to being there for us in our time of need. We thank you for those who were there yesterday at that house explosion, that they were able to keep the neighborhood and the people in that area safe. We pray for the family as they return home, that they're able to recover, to rebuild, to regain the life that they had and that they find the help they need. And again, if we could be of help, please show us how. <coughs> we pray for those we mentioned this morning with their various needs and concerns, Christine and Frank, Bob and Brian and Scott and Nancy, uh, Baby and Patty and Dave, Rachel and Johnny, Brian and Laura and Jean, Lord, you know their needs and concerns even better than we do. And for those who are close to us, we pray that you would help us to be able to comfort them in their time of need, to be able to help them in any way that we can, and always to be able to reassure them that you are there, that you love and care for us no matter what. We pray for the people of Ukraine and other areas of the world that are ravaged by war, by those who believe that they have the power to rule the lives of others in ways that are not just and not fair. And we pray, Lord, that there would be a change of heart, that peace would come to those areas, that peace would come to the world as you intend the world to be. We pray for those who are devastated by natural disasters as we hear so much about those these days and those things that we can't control. <laughs> Always a reminder of your power, knowing that you are there even in the midst of those things and you show your presence in those who come and help in your name. We ask now that you be with us today as we study your word, as we close out this season of Advent, as we prepare to celebrate the Christmas season. We thank you for the anticipation we have of the celebration of Jesus' birth or the anticipation of his coming again pray that you would always help us to remember the excitement, the anticipation, the goodness that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, yeah, I passed the lessons around. Um, so this is finally, um, we hear about uh, the birth of Jesus. Um, and... Uh, not exactly his birth, but the prediction of his birth, the uh, coming of, uh, well, Matthew's story of um, Mary and Joseph and the angel reassuring them that things would be okay. Um, so uh, we're getting closer again to uh, this uh, celebration of Jesus' birth, uh, but also, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we see uh, in Jesus' birth, the fulfillment of so many prophecies uh, that we look forward again to the fulfillment of all prophecies of Scripture. We look forward to that fulfillment of God's plan when Jesus comes again. And, uh, and so Christmas is, in one sense, uh, evidence of those things that are to come. Um, so Matthew 1, 18 through 25. So Matthew's story of Jesus' birth focuses on the role of Joseph, who adopts the divinely begotten child into the family of David and obediently gives him the name Jesus, which means God saves. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. 
and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son and named him Jesus. So, um, again, one version of a familiar story. Um, not quite the, the Linus version from Charlie Brown, but it is uh, <laughs> as one of the familiar stories of the birth of Jesus. Or the prophecy of the birth of Jesus, I should say. Um, before this, the first, uh, the opening of Matthew's gospel <clears throat> is uh, the genealogy of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we sometimes have a tendency to overlook that um, as it's just a list of names. <laughs> and uh, we wonder what it's really all about. Um, but we need to realize, too, that if Matthew includes this genealogy, there are some points <laughs> too. Um, he doesn't do it just to, to fill up space. Um, you know, it's not like the teacher gave him an assignment to write 5,000 words, and so he used this to fill up space. Um, there's some reason behind the genealogy. And through that genealogy, there are four women listed. And it's interesting, those women have several things that make them unique among other women of the Bible. Um, they have some scandalous backgrounds. They were prostitutes. They were victims of incest. They had some other... Um, things that would have been socially unacceptable at the time. Um, they were also Gentiles. They were Gentile women who are included in this genealogy of Jesus, uh, which many take to, to see as a sign that uh, from the very beginning, Jesus' mission was going to be universal, not only to the Jews. Um, you know, at one point Jesus said he came to the lost children of Israel but then he is more or less convinced by the, uh, the woman who talks about giving the children the crumbs from the uh, table um, that his mission, his ministry reaches out to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, we have, of course, the story of Paul, who was the apostle to the Gentiles and converted uh, so many Gentiles to Christianity. So one of the things those four women signify is that the universality of Jesus' mission, that he came for all people, not just the Jews. Um, interesting word forms here. Um, the birth of Jesus in Greek is the genesis of Jesus, um, which, of course, takes us back to the book of Genesis, the beginning of creation, the beginning of the world. Um, and... There are a couple connections here. Um, when we read our translation, it talks about the creation of heaven and earth, the creation of human beings. But if we would read the Greek manuscript of that or the original uh, versions of that, it says the genesis of the world, the genesis of human beings. It, is, it signifies that beginning, that new start. Um, God doing a new thing. And so when we hear about the genesis of Jesus, those people who are familiar with that connection to the Old Testament would see this as, oh, this is a new thing God is doing again. Um, you know, Genesis, the beginning of the world, the beginning of creation. Now the genesis of Jesus is that another new thing that God is about to do. Um Yes, it signifies this uh, new beginning. And it also, along with the genealogy, this idea of the Genesis, really 
emphasizes the idea that we see throughout Matthew um, when he says in verse 22, this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Much of Matthew's gospel talks about fulfillment of prophecy. It talks about connection to the Old Testament. And so some scholars believe that when the Bible was organized um, by whoever did that thousands of years ago, um, or at least hundreds of years ago, um, in deciding to put Matthew's gospel first, it was chosen because it has that closer connection to the Old Testament. It makes a sort of a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, it's pretty much um, accepted that Mark's gospel was probably the first one written. Uh, Mark's gospel was likely the first to be recorded. And so we might say, well, then why wasn't Mark the first one in the New Testament? But um, this connection to the Old Testament, again, something we see throughout um, Matthew's gospel. Um, and I think that's important for us to remember that we are not a new religion, if you will. We're not worshiping a new God. We are continuing to worship the God of Israel in a different way. We worship the God of Israel as he is revealed in Jesus. And so, you know, the, the Jews have that God of Israel as reviewed in his word, or as revealed in his word, as revealed to the prophets. Um, we, on the other hand, have Jesus and his word and, and his ministry. So we're worshiping the same God, but in a, in a different way. And so we need to make sure we maintain that connection. Um, I think the, the Mormon church, the ones that have the tabernacle down in uh, Lancaster, but they do a good job of, of maintaining that connection. You know, they, when you read some of their teachings and their writings, they do a, a really good job of maintaining that connection, perhaps a little better than many of us do. Um, a lot of Protestants, you know, and I think maybe probably some Lutherans included, just have a tendency to say, well, you know, that's the old stuff. We write that off, you know, and we just, we start with Jesus. But, um, you know, we include that Old Testament reading every week in our, our worship. Uh, it is an important part of who we are. And so it's something that um, we need to maintain. And again, you know, Matthew will see that we do that as we read through his gospel, how many things are uh, fulfillment of prophecy. Um, in that genealogy that I referred to earlier, um, as we go through that genealogy, and if you're familiar with it, um, in, you know, the older translations, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat, there was a lot of begetting that went on. Um, in the modern translation, uh, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, right? And it goes all the way down that list until verse 16, we hear Jacob, the father of Joseph, Joseph, the husband of Mary, to whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So it doesn't, Matthew doesn't say Joseph, the father of Jesus. He says, Joseph, the husband of Mary, to whom Jesus was born. And, uh, and then in verse 17, he talks about the generations from Abraham to David, 14, David to Babylon, 14, uh, and Babylon to the Messiah, 14. So those kind of things are kind of important to, uh, to Matthew. But that, that designation, that little change there at the end, lets us know that Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus. And so uh, that's, that's the change in the genealogy. Um, Joseph did not beget Jesus. <laughs> he was begotten by the Holy Spirit. Um, the word Messiah means anointed, uh, which was 
um, a designation for kings in the Old Testament. Kings were anointed. Uh, Messiah is used even of uh, Cyrus in the Old Testament, who was not a godly man, but God used him uh, for his purpose to take the Jews into Babylon. And so uh, that word is someone who is anointed, someone who is chosen. Um, and so we have come, of course, to relate that now to Jesus uh, as our Savior. But the original meaning was someone who was anointed as kings even were anointed. Um, and Christ is the Greek version of the word Messiah from the Hebrew. So that's where we get Jesus. And, and we sometimes we hear Jesus the Christ is really, you know, would be maybe a more proper way to say it. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Um, and so that's what Messiah means. Um, his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. And in those times, an engagement was uh, a contract pretty much equal to a marriage, except the two uh, who were engaged to each other didn't live together. It's still um, designated what we might call today an exclusive relationship. Um, it had you know, all the legal and social ramifications of a marriage, uh, except that the bride still lived at home and with her parents. So um, being not married, of course, you know, we have this idea that they are, um, you know, when we read later that they had no relations with each other, we talk about the virgin birth. Um, again, they, this is a way of emphasizing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, before they lived together, she was found to be with child. And uh, one of the commentators had the remark, he said, I wonder who found her. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, she, she, she found out she was pregnant. She realized she was pregnant. Um, you know, I guess women know these things, right? So, uh, <laughs> Uh, even, Ask your wife. <laughs> yeah. Well, my mother-in-law knew it supposedly before my wife did. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I think with me it was the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. She. she well, all the girls, whenever they announced they were pregnant, my mother. Was, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> uh, um, but one of the, the an interesting uh, comment uh, and a line of thinking that uh, that I came across with this lesson is we talk about the virgin birth being a miracle, and, and it is, but the one writer really emphasized the idea of a virgin conception. Mm -hmm. How could a child be conceived if there were no relation? If a woman is a virgin, how could she have conceived? So it's the conception that was really the miracle or the beginning of the miracle. And of course, you know, we know that is by the Holy Spirit. And um, one even goes on to, to question if uh, it was actually Mary's egg that was fertilized or if God just implanted Jesus, you know, as a, a, a fetus in Mary's womb without even using Mary's egg so that, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus had no human DNA at all. Now, we know he was fully human in the sense that he was here, he was with us, he was one of us. Um, and he makes the point that, you know, when God created the world, he created the world out of nothing. And so God could create Jesus out of nothing. He didn't need, he, he chose Mary to carry Jesus, to give Jesus life, um, but perhaps didn't use Mary's egg to, to do that. So these are all interesting things to think about. Um, all that matters to us is <laughs> it wasn't a regular birth. It didn't happen the way it happened for us. Um, and so, and again, the, the conception, I think, is a miracle. Uh, Jesus was miraculously conceived, and, uh, and the birth then happened the way any birth happens. Uh, but it was him being conceived that was the true miracle. Um, and... Um, 
and the child was from the Holy Spirit. In Luke, uh, an angel tells Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and she will have a child and all that. Um, here, Matthew just tells us that the child was from the Holy Spirit. He doesn't really talk about any warning to Mary. Um, and again, if we want to see a connection to Genesis, um, you know, in the, in the beginning, uh, when the world was created, the spirit moved over the waters. And that, you know, is the, the Greek word pneuma, where we get our word pneumonia, uh, the Hebrew word ruach. And they all mean wind, breath, spirit, all the same, uh, same kind of thing. So um, if we, we say that spirit that moved over the waters in creation is the same spirit that's active, uh, you know, as, as one of the persons of the Godhead, uh, then that same spirit is what brings Jesus to life through Mary. Um, her husband, Joseph, and again, uh, Matthew can call him her husband because um, being engaged was basically like being married. Um, some translations say betrothed. Um, they were betrothed uh, to Joseph. Um, was a righteous man. And that's another theme that runs throughout Matthew is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Jesus, the righteousness of people who are servants of God. Um, he holds up that idea of righteousness a lot. And um, being righteous is to act according to the divine agenda for actions, attitudes, and relationships. So, you know, when we ask what is righteous, basically it means we live according to God's will. You know, a righteous person lives according to the will of God um, and does what God would have us to do. Um, being a righteous man, um, Joseph was, in a sense, approved by God uh, to be the earthly father of uh, Jesus. Um, now, it talks about here that Joseph did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. And it was, of course, you know, for a long time in our history, but in that history as well, it was scandalous for a woman to uh, be pregnant and not be married. And, uh, you know, it's much less scandalous today than it used to be. Um, but, you know, for a long time, it was, was scandalous for a woman because it was assumed that she had committed adultery. And especially a woman who was already betrothed, someone who was engaged, someone who was as good as married, having being pregnant to someone who was not her husband or her betrothed. And so, you know, it was, it, you know, we say today she was cheating on it, you know, and this is how she got pregnant. And according to Jewish law, the right thing to do would have been to divorce her. Now, we think today about, you know, we talk about compassion and understanding and all those things, but it was understood in those days that the right thing to do was to divorce her. And so Joseph being a righteous man, doing God's will, keeping the law, would have, his first inclination was to divorce her. But Joseph, again, being compassionate, didn't want to make a public display of that. And so he was just going to quietly flip out of the picture, I guess, you know. Um, well, however, he thought he was going to do that, but he wasn't, um, wasn't going to open Mary up to that kind of public disgrace. Um, at one time, um, the penalty for... Uh, being pregnant and not being married or having committed adultery was a woman could be stoned to death. Now, by this time in history, that had pretty much uh, was no longer the accepted punishment for stoning. Um, but, you know, public shame, being a social outcast, all those things 
uh, would come along with being pregnant and, and not being married or be con being considered an adulteress. Um, so again, Joseph uh, was a righteous man, yet he chose to go a little bit against his own righteousness. And um, he was going to do the right thing, but he was going to do it quietly. Um, you know, he was going to, it was just going to be private, more or less. Um, when he resolved to do this, an angel, angel is uh, a word that comes from the word messenger, euangelion, where we get good news, messenger, uh, and angel, that's, in scripture, that angels were messengers of the Lord. They brought messages. An angel came to Mary and spoke to her. An angel came to Joseph. Um, and so the angel appeared to Joseph. Um, he had this uh, divine revelation, if you will. Um, the same thing we'll see later when the Magi come. And, you know, they go to Herod, and Herod wants them to find the baby so he can uh, eliminate the baby. And But an angel comes to them in a dream and says, don't go back to Herod. So we have this way of communicating um, the messengers of God, communicating with people uh, in their dreams. Um, he refers to Joseph as son of David. And again, if we go back to that genealogy, we see where uh, David is included in that line. And uh, so this legitimates Jesus as being in the line of David. And he is adopted into that line. Basically, when he follows the commandment to name the baby Jesus and the accepted practice, the tradition in those days was that a man more or less became a child's father when he named that child. So by naming Jesus, being the one to name Jesus, uh, Joseph is the one who becomes Jesus earthly father, adopted earthly father. Um, and the thinking behind that is that a man would not name a child or, and, and claim a child that way that was not his. And so it was assumed that if a man named a child, that was it was his child biologically. So uh, this again is how Jesus is sort of uh, adopted into that line of David uh, uh, at the time when Joseph names him, and as the angel told him to. Um, the word Jesus uh, comes is also to be Joshua, and, um, and it means God saves. And uh, so when we see he named him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, Joshua, Jesus, Yeshua, literally means God saves. And so that's where Jesus got his name. Um, he will save his people. He will redeem their people from their sins. Uh, and that is now Jesus' mission. That is why Jesus was born. Um, I shared with some folks a while ago that I uh, caused a little turmoil in my internship congregation uh, when they were, you know, our one of our favorite sayings, Jesus is the reason for the season. And I said, no, Jesus is not the reason for the season. Sinfulness of the world is the reason for the season. Jesus is the solution to the problem. So, you know, I mean, that's just another way to look at it. Um, but it says here, you know, name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came to save us from our sins. And so our sinfulness is the reason Jesus came. Our sinfulness is the reason for the season. Jesus is the solution. Jesus does for us what we could never do for ourselves. So, uh, of course, that all won't fit on a bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't sound nearly as nice. Uh, but, uh, but again, it's something to, to keep in our mind that, you know, um, our, our faith is much deeper uh, and what I call, you know, bumper sticker theology. Uh, we need to think more deeply about what this is all about. And 
all this took place, and when we, we read all this, where we're talking about all this stuff that has happened up to this point, um, you know, the conception, the angel coming to Joseph, um, all these things, all that has come up to this point um, is to fulfill again uh, what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Um, and Matthew's theme of the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, the prophet is the prophet Isaiah, um, comes from uh, Isaiah 7, verse 14, which will be our first reading for this week, Isaiah 7. Um, and again, some interesting information on this idea of the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now this, well, I'll read you what, what uh, Brian Stoffer did has to say here. And it's, it's an interesting, again, discussion. Um, there's nothing in Jewish history or pagan history that might lead to the virginal conception stories of Jesus. The easiest explanation is that's what happened. And so he's, he's talking about, you know, some of our tradition, some of our stories have corresponding or similar stories in other faiths and other religions. You know, there's always, they say there's a great flood story in every religion, you know, um, and those kind of things. But there's nothing in other religions and in pagan worship. A woman may be impregnated by a god. A woman is impregnated, but it happens in a more conventional kind of way. In this way, there's nothing conventional happened, but Mary becomes pregnant. <laughs> so he says, you know, the, the best explanation is that's what happened. It, it must be true. Um, from what happened, Matthew looked back and used Isaiah 7.14 as part of his fulfillment theme. So again, as we said, we look at the suffering servant passages. We look at so many things in the Old Testament that we look now knowing, uh, you know, from, from now looking back, we say, oh, that's talking about Jesus. That's talking about Jesus. Where at the time, nobody had any idea who or what Jesus would have been. If that's what happened, why is it only in two writings? And again, we only have um, two of the Gospels that tell the birth story of Jesus. Um, an obvious answer, Matthew and Luke were dealing with situations where promoting the virginal conception was important. One of those situations might have been the question, when did Jesus become God's son? Paul suggests that the resurrection declares Jesus to be the son of God. By the time of Mark, we the readers know that the identity of Jesus as Son of God begins at baptism and continues through his ministry, even if it was not publicly known until the crucifixion. In Matthew, the identity of Jesus as the Son of God is pushed back to his conception, as it is in Luke, something acknowledged by characters in their narratives. The Gospel of John pushes Jesus' divinity back to before creation. So if you remember John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, all things were created through him. So as the different gospel writers, it seems they were dealing with this idea of when did Jesus become God's son? Um, let's see, perhaps declaring Jesus' divine connection at conception was an issue that Matthew needed to address in his gospel. So you know, people were asking that question. Um, when did Jesus become God's son? Matthew felt the need to address that. And so Matthew says it happened at conception. He was, he was God's son from the time he was conceived. Um, and uh, there is, again, um, when we look at uh, a literal translation of well, in fact, our modern day translation of this verse from Isaiah, let me just find that. Um, Isaiah is before Jeremiah. There we go. Um, Isaiah 7.14. It says, 
Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. So Isaiah doesn't talk about a virgin. He talks about a young woman. Um, and again, you know, the, there's a, a footnote here uh, in the NRSV uh, that the Greek version of that is a virgin. So, um, again, it's that, you know, as, as Stockford just said, it's what happens. And this is how we, we have come to explain it and believe it. Um, so, um, let's see, young woman, and, and, and it was a miracle, you know, of course, definitely a miracle that Jesus, that Mary conceived. Um, but that idea of the virgin birth isn't necessarily from that prophecy in Isaiah. But another point that some of the writers make is that it, it really wasn't a big deal in the days when the Gospels were written. Because, as we said, only two of the four Gospels mention a virgin birth. Uh, only two of the Gospels tell the story of Jesus' birth at all. Um, and that's Matthew and Luke. Mark starts with John the Baptist. John starts with the beginning of the world way back and um, doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus. He jumps to his baptism. So um, the idea of Jesus' birth, that virgin birth, it wasn't a topic of concern, really, when the Gospels were written. So there may be some people were questioning, some people were wondering, um, but you know, if we would were to uh, write the story of Jesus today, I think that some you know topics of to, that are hot topics today would probably uh, you know it would be probably much more political today than when it was written um, shortly after Jesus' day. So, um, so again, it wasn't a big deal, and even those two who mention it don't mention it anymore throughout the rest of the gospel. It's kind of like in the beginning, oh, yeah, Jesus was, Mary was a virgin, she had Jesus, and then this is what happened. You know, so it's, it's not really a big deal to them. Um, and, but yet people today get hung up on it. Well, that's impossible, that couldn't happen, you know, how can you believe that? Well, you know, it's what we believe, so. Um, they shall name him Emmanuel, according to the prophecy. And again, this is not just Joseph, but everyone will refer to him as Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And again, this is the only place this is mentioned, uh, the name Emmanuel. Um, sometimes you see it spelled with an I, which is the more Hebrew version of Emmanuel. In fact, um, yeah, in uh, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, it's spelled with an I. Um, some people only put one M in it. But um, a little tip, when you see anything that has to do with Jewish faith that has L on the end, it's talking about God. Israel is God's people. Um, and I guess, well, even maybe at the beginning, El Shaddai is a name for God. So that L... In, in Hebrew, it uh, signifies God. Beth El, um, you know, whatever the Beth means, connected to God. So, um, which means God is with us. And again, this is uh, an important theme in Matthew. He ends his gospel uh, with Jesus saying, I will be with you always to the end of the age this idea of the presence of Jesus. Um, of course, we, we have that presence now in the Holy Spirit as the, the physical Jesus has gone, has ascended into heaven. Um, but we still have that presence of Jesus with us in the Holy Spirit. Um, and to remember that it is God with us. It is God with us in the presence of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not that God was with us, 
or not that God will be with us, but God is with us here and now. And to remember that we are always living in the presence of God. Um, and uh, so Joseph awoke. He did what the angel commanded him. And again, this was showed Joseph's great faith. Um, talked last week a little bit about how faith comes from the word, uh, not always from what we see, but what we hear. And what Joseph had was the reassurance of the angel that spoke to him in a dream, the word of the messenger um, that he believed and had faith in. Um, and and so uh, that's, again, Joseph was a faithful man. He was righteous. He was deemed worthy to be the, the adoptive father of the son of God. Um, so, you know, Joseph must have been a pretty special guy as well as Mary. Um, so God is with us. He did as a took her. And the uh, well, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary. And now it says he took her as his wife. Um, that is the Greek word paralambano, which means to take something or someone home. So he, he, he took her home. And now they live together. Now they're husband and wife. Um, but he points out that there was no marital relations until she had born a son. Um, so there could be no accusations uh, that Jesus was not uh, divinely conceived and not the son of God. Um, so um, it's, uh, you know, we, we have, some characters here who are very important, um, you know, Joseph and Mary, uh, both faithful people, both. And you notice one of the things that we see so often when an angel appears to someone, Jesus does the same thing, but when an angel appears to someone in Scripture, the first thing they say is, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. And you know, there is that sense of if you if you feel you're in a divine presence, if, you know, an angel, a messenger comes to speak to you, it's like, whoa, what's going on? You know, but the angel says, don't, don't be afraid. It's, it's okay. God, God's got this, you know. So um, just do what you're told. God's got this and everything will be all right. Um, so that's. You know, that word of reassurance is something throughout scripture that we, we need to always be reminded of as well. So, um, and then I just had highlighted here another little thing from uh, Sausagen about Jesus um, being adopted. Um, it says, Jesus is the son of David because of his genealogy. But Joseph didn't begat him. The Davidic descendancy is not transferred through natural paternity, but through legal paternity. By naming the child, Joseph acknowledges him as his own. The Jewish position on this is lucidly clear and is dictated by the fact that sometimes it's difficult to determine who begot a child biologically. Since normally a man will not acknowledge and support a child unless it is his own, the law prefers to base paternity on the man's acknowledgement. Uh, the Mishnah, Baba Bakra, H6, <laughs> states the principle. If a man says, this is my son, he is to be believed. Joseph, by exercising the father's right to name the child, acknowledges Jesus and thus becomes the legal father of the child. So, then, uh, not the biological father, but the legal father. So... Jesus is coming. The angel said so. See, that's that's all the part of the custom that we don't understand, though. That they they name the son, and then and legally he's yours, and all that. It, yeah. It's really interesting to learn yeah. how things were. Things are so different. Now, but not really. I mean, we see that today. If uh, you know, a couple gets married, and say the woman already has a child when they get married. And then the father legally adopts that child. You know, it becomes his child legally. Um, 
or, you know, so in whatever the circumstances, if a woman has a child when she's not married, if she has a child from another marriage, uh, and then marries someone else, the father legally adopts that child that becomes his child. That's true. So um, in that sense, you know, uh, we have that, that same idea of the legal adoption. So, and, and you know, in most cases where, where a, a man is willing to do that, then he accepts that child as his own and raises that child as his own and loves it just as much, you know. That was a lot easier though. He just he just did it. There yeah. was no there was no he yeah. no lawyers involved. Yeah. Involved yeah, he just said, Oh, I named this kid Jesus. Okay, he's yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But who were those four women? Did they did they tell? Oh uh, yeah. Let's see. I mean I I should know it off by, by heart, but as I, you know, I think I've said this before. I know it's in the Bible. I know where to find oh, it. That, I thought it was there. You don't have to. No, well, let's see. I thought it was there. Four the women. It says, well, I'll, I'll just read you the whole thing because it's um, a, a count of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. She's the first one. Zerah. Tamar. Oh. Tamar. Tamar was the first one. Uh, Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Aram. Aram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab's the second one. She was a prostitute. Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, she's the third one. Um, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, so that was Bathsheba, so she'd be the fourth one. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, I guess that's where we get jump in Jehoshaphat. Um, <laughs> Joram, the father, this sounds like a, a, a football team. <laughs> Isaiah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. No wonder he jumped over it. After the deportation to Babylon, <laughs> Jeconiah, the father of Salafiel, <laughs> Salafiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abiyah, Abiyah, the father of Eliakim. Hey, it's 11 o'clock. Right? <laughs> Actually, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> the father of Eliud, oh, Eliud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Matthew, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph. The husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wouldn't that be not, uh, yeah, that'd be an interesting reading for Sunday morning, right? Oh, I can deny that. Yeah. I can see people sit there going, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they leave. I had yeah, <laughs> never mind. We're going home. But, you know, again, you know, if you would go back, and it, it's kind of interesting. You know, I've been doing this thing, uh, it's through the Bible in a year, uh, which has taken me more than a year because I don't do Sundays and stuff, but um, it's a, an audio version of the Bible. You can read while you listen, uh, but it gives you an Old Testament, a couple usually Old Testament readings, a gospel reading, and then a psalm and a proverb every day. And as I'm going through that Old Testament, and a lot of those names you recognize as the names that are now in the, the genealogy of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if you would go back maybe and look all of them up and see what their connection was, then we it would be probably make more sense to us. You know, mm -hmm. Did you well, post it like Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to do that for your homework, you can go back and look up all those names. <laughs> Shall I make a report? <laughs> 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 I'll get right on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah give us a report. Oh, uh, see what next is next. Wow. Next week is the week before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do we, we have, take? Do we have Bible study next week? Yeah, why don't we take next week off? Okay. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, because Christmas Eve will be Saturday. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Christmas Eve aside. Or yeah, something. wow. That's, man, that came I know. It comes so fast. Yeah. So let's have no Bible study next week. I was going to say, I'm <laughs> off the hook then. I, I think right. that's yeah. what the, the December came too early this year. Yeah. So, that's that's for sure. Yeah. Right. So let's, uh, let's close with the duty. Um, and, Pastor Jim, you had a wonderful uh, service here on this. Uh, I watched Dr. David Jeremiah, and it was a why in the nativity and it was oh. was on this whole oh it was wonderful yeah i watched doc i'm sorry i watch dr david jeremiah all the time yeah when it comes on my tv and uh, he's very and he interviews uh sheila walls and they have questions Ooh. and it's it the whole they had the cameras the whole thing on yeah. i i was going to say the same thing uh, they showed uh a movie they had made of of the uh, um <clears throat> conception conception story and and it was just beautiful the way they did it uh i mean the the scenes and and yeah. it's like they were in israel and and how mary heard the angel and then how joseph did it it was just yeah. really very meaningful it was just yeah. that part of the story and and, and that was done by dr jeremiah yeah. and his sister yes yeah. It, but I, best I, movie I've seen for yeah. a long time. But I watch, you really believe. You just can't help but believe. I'm sorry. I watch his program all the time. Yeah. Comes on when they, they didn't show an angel. No. I, it, you heard it. Yeah. You heard it. And, and, and Joseph, too. And, uh, yeah, and, and the oh. thing, I've seen uh, Joyce about them going in and they really traveled. And, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really, oh. Okay. Well, Camel. Oh, I'm sorry, but that's what it, that's what it is yeah. very interesting when I get to I get excited and I turn the channel yeah. and I hope, I hope there's no interruption. Uh, I mean, I'll end put my phone right beside the table yeah. where my yeah. TV is and and control and bingo. Yeah. Cool. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but I, I had I had to share that.